Well, good morning. I want to start off with a public service announcement. To my left, I have two emails. One is real, one is fake. The first email right here says, to Olivia, Brian Jones, pastor of Christ Church, are you available? I urgently require your assistance because I am currently participating in a virtual conference. Please respond here if you are accessible. Second email, Brian Jones to Olivia, dear Olivia, I need Eagle tickets, or let's just say I might take it out of your pay, all right? Which one is real, right? Obviously, is the second one? The second one's the real one, right? This one's the spam one. Um, uh, pretty much on social media, everybody knows I don't answer DMs and and my accounts now are verified, and you have the blue dot and all that sort of thing. So really the only thing scammers have left is to send fake emails. Just understand, I'm not inaccessible, and I need you to respond here. And usually they're asking for gift cards. All you have to do is look at this and click this, and it will show it's like some Yahoo 379A, you know, that sort of thing. So anyway, okay. We are finishing up a series today called What Would Jesus Undo? And I want to start by sharing something that's really important that is really going to help you either now or very, very soon. Every person in this room will experience this spiritually. Um, They will start out really high and go really low. Have you had that happen before? You're like, man, I'm really excited about my faith, the church, all that sort of thing. And then you're like, meh. And then you're up again, right? Oh, we're going, we're doing it. And then you're down again, and then you're up, right? Here's another way of thinking about it. Every person in this room will experience, go to the next one, joy. Like, uh, like I'm fired up. Or you might be like, oh, I'm so excited. Or I used to get excited. Or like, I want to punch happy people in the face, right? Um, Or, you know, the the, the difference is is big. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. In the fourth century, when Constantine uh, became both the ruler of the Roman Empire and the head of the church, uh, he exerted control. Lots of not great things happened uh, to Christianity. But one thing that happened is a lot of Christians went to the desert. Why do you think they went to the desert? What did Jesus do before he started his ministry? Went to the desert. These people were called the desert mothers or the desert fathers, and they learned lots of things about the spiritual life. Um, These are monks that ate no cooked food for seven years, or they would go and they would sleep on purpose in a bog that was mosquito infested and lots of gross stuff. One guy was a guy named Simeon the Stillite. Simeon Um, built a 60-foot high pole, and on the top of that, he built a base, three feet by three feet, with a little little rail around it, and they tied a rope to the top of the pole. So in case if he fell off, you know, he wouldn't go that far. Uh, Simon the Stillite did that. He never showered for 30 years. They brought up his... um, food, and then, well, I guess he would stick his butt over and poop. So that's what he did. And uh, Simon the Stillite would say, uh, because of that rope went around his torso, that um, worms would eat the flesh. And when a worm would fall, fall off, he would grab it and pick it back up and say, eat that which the Lord has given you. Super creepy, right? But these, pe- these are people who bound themselves with chains, mixed their food with sand. There was one monk in Albania who forced himself to spend three days and three nights, literally 24-7, as the fellow members of their monastic order took, chur- took churns with their fingernails, drawing them across a chalkboard. 24, actually, I just completely made that up, but that would be bad. Some of you don't even, you're, you're too young to remember an actual chalkboard, right? And the sound that fingernails make, but it's, trust me, it's bad. 
these, these um, ideas that they learned about the spiritual life, it was these people in the desert that eventually coined what was called the seven deadly sins and considered worse, the worst out of all of them was the sin of asadia. Asadia comes from two Greek words, which means essentially, I don't care. This is a, a, whenever you see a word that starts with an A, usually it's called in grammar an alpha privative, and it just, it negates what you see. And so this, the Greek word sados, a se di a, essentially is the spiritual sin of not caring anymore. It makes me think of that song by the, by the Ramones. You guys ever listen to the Ramones? Am I the only one that likes the Ramones 20, 20, 24 hours ago? Come on. I want to be sedated. Thank you. Yes. You learn a lot here in this church. Anyway, so we've been talking about stopping different sins. But what happens when you get to the point where you're like, I don't care anymore. I don't care. That's a sadia. And what I want to do is I'm going to talk about what a sadia is, and then I want to talk about how do you fix it, because I'm telling you right now, if you're here right now, you're going to go down here but there's no guarantee you're going to go back up. Getting down from here to here, you don't have to do anything. But getting from here to here and go back up, you do. So the characteristics of Asadia first, weariness. Feeling very spiritually weary. John Cassian said, our sixth combat is what the Greeks call Asadia, which we may term weariness or distress of the heart. You remember John the Baptist was all excited about Jesus. He gets thrown in jail. And then what does he ask his followers to do? Go find Jesus and ask him a question. What does he ask? Are you the one or should we expect another, right? Like how bad does it have to get? You're super excited about Jesus. You are preparing the way for the Lord. And then two months later, you're like, bro, are you who you say you are? That's weariness. The second characteristic is no passion. Got a question for you. Are you more excited about your relationship with God and about serving the Lord and about your faith than you were one year ago? One of, uh, one of uh, my favorite writers on the spiritual life is a woman named Kathleen Norris. She wrote a book called um, Dakota, which I highly suggest. And she wrote a book called Asadia in Me. Now, I'm about to read a quote that has a swear word. It's not me. I'm still going to read it. She said, Asadia is like morphine. You know the pain is there, yet you just can't rouse yourself to give a damn. That's what it means to have no passion, to be weary. The next thing is boredom. You're like, eh. Right? John Cassian, at the end of this quote right here, he says, uh, he often groans because it can do no good while he stays there and complains and sighs because he can bear no spiritual fruit so long as he is joined to that society. In other words, have you ever been like, you're, at one point you're really excited about your faith, and the next point you're like, honestly, we're just going to stay today and go to Bedside Baptist, right? We're phoning it in today. Let's be honest, we're super glad that there are people that are joining us here. But be honest, some of you, the reason you're at Bedside Baptist is because of this. It's boredom and weariness, right? Here's the last thing that you know when you have a sadia is that there's contempt for spiritual community. When you're weary and you have no passion and you're bored, your immediate thought is, the problem is, lean to the person next to you and say, look them in the eye, go ahead, do that right now. Lean to the person next to you and say, it's your problem. You are the reason that I am weary, I have no passion, and I'm bored, right? It's just, it's just a really easy thing to do. You're the reason, you're the problem, right? This place, right? And so... Um, St. Benedict was um, uh, the guy that is responsible for overseeing what you would call Benedictine monasteries. Uh, St. Benedict 
added a fourth vow because of this very problem. People uh, in the 5th century and in the 6th century, they were constantly going from one monastery to the next one, right? They would stay at a monastery, and they were like, duh, this place isn't doing it anymore. Then they would go to another one, right? Translated today, there would be people who would be a part of a church, and then they're like, this isn't working for any more anymore. I'm going to go to another one, and then I'm going to go to another one, and then I'm going to go to another one. So anyway, St. Benedict came up with a fourth vow. We all know, or maybe let's rehearse, what are the vows that a monk will take? A vow of poverty, chastity, and obedience, right? Poverty is I'm giving all of my resources to the community. Chastity is I'm no longer going to have sex. Obedience, I'm going to live here and I'm going to obey the abbot. St. Benedict came along and he said, this problem of people going from one place to another, constantly searching for their next spiritual high, he added poverty, chastity, obedience, and the last one is stability. You stay. If you can look back at the person next to you that said, you said you're the problem, they're not the problem. And in fact, you're not the problem either. We all go through spiritual highs, like Blaise Pascal. Everybody knows mathematician, uh, philosopher Blaise Pascal. You have heard of probably Pascal's wager, right? And the wager is pretty simple. If you say and believe that there is a God, then if there is, after you die, eh, you could be with God. But if you don't believe that there's a God, if there is a God, you're in trouble. If there isn't a God, you lived a good moral life and invested in the people around you. So what, where's, take that gamble. It's worth it. Blaise Pascal is the one that popularized that. Anyway, when Blaise Pascal died, they found sewn into his coat a wad of paper. And this wad of paper described a moment in his life. Let me describe it. They took out the piece of paper. They flattened it. And then they read it, and this is what was tucked inside of Blaise Pascal's coat. In the year of grace, 1654, on Monday, 23rd of November, feast of St. Clement, Pope and Martyr, and of the others in the martyrology, vigil of St. Chrysogenus, Martyr and others, from about half past 10 in the evening, so at 10.30 in the evening, until half past 12 for two hours, Fire, fire, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not of the philosophers and scholars, certitude, certitude, feeling, joy, peace, God of Jesus Christ for two full hours, fire spiritually. I want to ask you, when was the moment for you, you were like, that was fire? Can you think of it? What is the moment you're like, like, that is when I was here. Sometimes we're really close to God, and then sometimes we're distant. And then the reason I wanted to go over this is this. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship. The problem that people have when they go through Asadia is if you think it's a religion, you're going to keep finding a new place. The problem is, Christianity isn't a religion. Christianity is a relationship. And so everybody knows in a relationship, sometimes it's here, and sometimes the relationship's down here, right? Now, I mean, not for my marriage, because of me. It's here. Fire, baby! It is fire. I'm bringing the fire, right? But we all do that, right? It's here, and then it will go down, because this is the way relationships work. And what happens for newer Christians especially, when they first experience asadia, not caring, feeling bored, weary, no passion, and then looking to the people around them and say, this place sucks, whether it's a place you went to or the next place you go, you think that this is the issue because this is a religion, and I'm telling you, it's a relationship. So 
How do you handle acedia when it cups up? Let me give you some suggestions. First, and let me just pause and say this. Acedia is not depression, right? Depression is psychological and physiological. Acedia is a sin because you choose to stay in it, right? You, maybe you might be able to, to, to medicate your way out of depression, but you will not be able to medicate your way out of acedia. Feeling bored and listless and I don't feel any passion and it used to be great five years ago, but not now. Staying there in the same way, if you're in a relationship with someone, you're like, no, I'm choosing to stay down here. I'm not gonna work on this relationship. I'm gonna stay here in the pit of despair. That is a sin, staying there. It's very, very different. So the first thing that the Bible tells us to do when we're facing weariness, boredom, and no passion, and no desire to be around other Christians is first to put on our gloves. We have to understand that we have to attack acedia because acedia is attacking us. Right, Romans 12, 11 says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Never be lacking in zeal. In other words, this is something that we have to fight against, of giving up essentially on our relationship with Jesus. The second thing is that realize a spiritual problem requires a spiritual solution. When I turned 16, do you remember when you got your driver's license? What is the deal with kids turning 16 and not wanting their driver's license? What is the deal? Man, when I turned 16, I was gone. I was in my dad's 1983 Pontiac Bonneville. Oh, it was a chick magnet, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I was gone. Anyway, I love to drive. I love to be out. And I love to go fishing. I, I love to go fishing. And so I remember I drove one time all the way up to Mount Vernon, Ohio, about an hour from my house. And I found a river called the Cocosine River. Anyway, it doesn't mean anything to you other than I prefer to go fishing for smallmouth bass rather than largemouth bass. Again, if you don't like to fish, that doesn't mean anything to you. I love the skill that it takes to fish in rivers and pools with different, to fish for smallmouth bass. Anyway, I'm up fishing on the Cocosine, I'm wading in the river, and I'm, 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 pl I'm plugging through all of these pools, and then I notice there is a pond over there that people can't get to, because you have to literally wade through the river to go to this pond. And I'm like, I'm going to go over there. So I go back to my car. I grab the different poles because fishing for largemouth bass is different than smallmouth bass. So anyway, I'm, I'm grabbing this stuff. I go through the river. It's about this high. I wave to the other side. And then I go over this little hill and I go down and I start to walk around the base of this big pond. I walk out about 100 feet and all of the sudden, the floor drops out from underneath me and I am literally up to here, up to my chin in mud. I didn't realize that this pond where it had dried, essentially the top layer had dried, but underneath it was water. And I'm like, this is where I die. This is it. And I called out to the Lord. I confessed every sin that I could possibly confess. I made a bargain. If for you, you know, it's the whole, I promise, I'll become a monk. I will, you know, and I'm doing all of this. And somehow, I was able to edge myself out of this, but I'll never forget that experience because it helps me understand this psalm that I'm about to read to you. Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. 
He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear Yahweh and put their trust in him. And so if you're there, if you're down here in the slimy pit, the thing to do is not to quit. It's, it's, it's an act of defiance. It's, it's an act of faith. I'm calling to you. We're in a relationship. I need you now more than ever. And so the last one is, I, I've got two more. The last one is, do the dishes and yard work and fix the sink. Um, there's this quote among Zen Buddhists. We're not Zen Buddhists, but there's this quote that says, after ecstasy, the laundry. Lisa was like, you can't say that. I'm like, they're not talking about sex. They're talking about spiritual experience. After you have a spiritual experience, the laundry. The Apostle Paul said this to people who were in um, the city of Thessalonica. They were like waiting for Jesus. They're all fervent. And he said, listen, bro, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and to work with your hands. Most important thing, if you're down here, go work in the yard. Go clean the basement. Go clean out the junk drawer. Keep doing that. Keep working with your hands. There's something about that primal, instinctive behavior of completely avoiding the problem of our spiritual dryness that creates like fertile ground for us to move forward. And then finally, find your place to serve in the church. Um, Poet um, David White was speaking to the Benedictine monk, Brother David Stendhal Rouse. David White said, I need your help. Speak to me about exhaustion. And Brother Stendhal Rao said, listen, you know the antidote to exhaustion is not necessarily rest. Right, we know that, right? Like, if you're exhausted, there's some forms of exhaustion that if you keep sleeping and sleeping and sleeping, it makes it worse. So, you know the antidote to exhaustion is not necessarily rest. The antidote to exhaustion is wholeheartedness. The reason you're so exhausted is that much of what you are doing you have no affection for. You're doing it because you have an abstract idea that this is what you should be doing in order to be liked. And I think Jesus is asking you, why were you saved and what is he calling you to do? How can he use you? How can you put all of your chips across the table and say, I'm all in. Use me. How do you want to use me? in the church to serve others. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for calling us to undo our polite satisfaction with just living with certain sins. Probably the worst one of all is experiencing asadia, dryness, and then just giving up, fading away, checking out, getting out of the habit. Heavenly Father, we ask you to draw us to yourselves. We ask you to help us to have the strength to cry out in the slimy pit. Help us to feel the hand grabbing us. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. Make sure to check out Brian's new book, Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, Wealth, and Happiness. To sign up for Brian's newsletter, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com.